thank you very much sir presence here this is the evening to talk about you know global warming and various you know repercussions due to uh, waste created by human beings and uh, i think uh, we circulated uh, professor babu's uh, cv but anyway I, for for my sake i'll read it he is a very very experienced highly experienced professor from usa uh, his background is uh, he obtained his phd in chemical engineering from case western reserve university in 1975 he then joined the energy lab of massachusetts institute of technology usa uh, where he worked on modeling and simulation of energy conversion processes he joined the faculty of chemical engineering at washington university in st louis in 1978 where he became the edward c dick professor in 2000 in 2002 he moved to become chair of chemical and biomedical engineering at university of southern florida he is the author of two books uh, real time personal computing for data acquisition and control uh, published by prentice hall in 1989 and techniques of mod model based control co-authored with dr c b brasilo again uh, prentice hall publication in 2002 Uh, and he has also edited volumes and over 200 technical publications he has published and during the year 1985-86 he was visiting professor at the university of california at berkeley his research is focused on renewable energy in general and in the production of liquid fuels from biomass in particular he has developed new catalytic technology for converting syn gas to liquid fuels Together, together with Professor Kuhn and his students, Dr. Joseph is the founder of Trash to Cash Energy, a small business a firm working on commercializing technology for converting landfill gases into diesel and jet fuel. Uh, so, I think uh, we are very fortunate to have him here to make this presentation today. Uh, uh, you know, he has a lot of experience in. Uh, uh, development of catalyst to make uh, fuel from bio materials he gave a very very good lecture yesterday at dinosaur laboratory which was enjoyed and by all the the audience so i am sure uh, you will uh, enjoy and uh, his lecture which will also be in, uh, informative and especially for research students i think his research is quite interesting and maybe you all can establish contact with him and pursue your research with his guidance in the future so i uh, invite i also Uh, welcome uh, dr joseph babu and his uh, uh, spouse uh, mrs joseph who is also a long you know experienced professional so uh, let me welcome to joseph uh, to make his presentation and uh, this presentation is on real time uh, yeah broadcasted so uh, you will have to use this mic yeah Thank you very much, Dr. Anol. I, can you hear me? Okay. I would like to thank the uh, Department of uh, Chemical and Process Engineering at uh, University of Manitoba, uh, and especially Dr. Anol for arranging this talk. And it's an, again a great pleasure for me to be here and uh, talking to you, uh, the audience. So, as Dr. Anol mentioned, I am uh, temporarily. stationed at uh, IIT Bombay on a Fulbright program and uh, that that's enabled me to come here as well my talk today is going to focus on uh, the production of liquid fuels from um, landfill gases in particular and um, i'm going to start off with um, a why we why we need to do this So here I have a picture of the amount of our coal, oil, and gas that is used over the last uh, couple of hundred years. And after the industrial revolution started with the invention of the steam engine, that's when it began to take off. And coal was predominant. Eventually, oil became more pro prominent. Uh, on the right-hand side, which is the 
curve here that shows you the amount of carbon dioxide in parts per million in the atmosphere. And there is a, as you can see, a direct correlation between the two, between the use of fossil fuels, as we call them, and the CO2 buildup, which is actually blamed for global warming. And, and global warming has led to, we believe, an increase in the sea level. This is over the last 100 years. The sea level has increased uh, by about 10 inches due to primarily the melting of the ice caps leading to increased uh, water in the ocean. So if this trend continues, this can uh, possibly lead to uh, significant flooding along the coastal areas uh, all over the world. So it is a major concern for us. If you look at uh, the amount of energy used in the US, uh, this is from 2011, from a data compiled by Lawrence Lormo lab. On the left hand side here, I have shown the sources of energy. On the right hand side are where they are used. So the uh, main source is coming from uh, petroleum at the bottom, that's the largest source, coal, and you have natural gas. So the fossil fuels are dominating in terms of the sources of energy. There's a small amount of other sources like hydroelectric, biomass, uh, uh, solar energy and so on, but they are not contributing a whole lot. The usage is residential, commercial, industrial and transportation, transportation being dominant, being the major user of petroleum. And uh, on, uh, on the right hand side you can see that in fact a large percentage of the energy is actually wasted as uh, uh, rejected, only a smaller 41% is actually used. And that is due to the inefficiencies involved in the conversion of one type of energy to another type, mostly to electricity or other forms. Another uh, view of the US energy consumption, USA is a major consumer of energy, that's why it's important to look at that. And uh, petroleum is 37%, renewable energy is about 8%. Out of the 8% renewable energy, about 50% uh, of that, that's 4% of the energy comes from biomass, which is uh, wood, biofuels, and biomass waste contribute to that. To, to that. A smaller percentage comes from solar, that is increasing, and uh, wind, wind is also increasing. So biomass, uh, as I speak, uh, there are quite a variety of sources for biomass, starting with uh, crop residues. So I was talking to Dr. Anul here. He has been working quite a bit with uh, the straw that is left behind in the rice fields uh, that, that is often burned in order to get rid of the straw. Forestry residues, then uh, coming from industrial uh, waste, as well as from animal husbandry, such as uh, cow farms or chicken farms also produce a lot of biomass waste. And then of course we humans produce a lot of municipal solid waste as well. Uh, just to give you some ideas about the agricultural residues, rice, wheat, corn, for every uh, yield like 3.6 tons of per acre, the residue is almost double. Okay, so you're leaving behind that much so many tons of um, straw behind and as, so is the case with many other products. If you look at uh, forest residues, there is quite a bit available all over the world in terms of um, available energy, that post potential source of energy. Uh, sugar crops uh, such as um, barley, corn uh, also yield be, um, leave behind quite a bit of residues. This is uh, residue to crop ratio. Um, oftentimes uh, sugar crops are used to produce ethanol as a source of bioenergy bio but it's been proven that this is really not an efficient way to produce fuel, uh, biofuels. This is a typical uh, production from a dairy, kilograms per head of cattle per day. Uh, again quite a large amount of waste is generated in this uh, 
this is solid waste generation in India, which has also, you know, as the country is developing, the municipal solid waste generation millions of tons per year has been growing along with the population as well as increasing the standard of living has led to this increase in the amount of solid waste. If you look at uh, how, what happens to all this solid waste, where garbage ends up, this is for the picture for the United States and this is for the rest of the world or developed world rather. And you can see from here that uh, in, uh, even though the amount of garbage that is put in landfills has been decreasing, it, uh, still a large percentage of the uh, solid waste ends up in a landfill. A small amount is uh, used for converted to energy. The red percentage shows you the percentage converted to energy. And uh, as another fraction is recycled or composted. If you look at Sweden, for example, uh, you'll see that uh, almost 50% is burned for energy and the remaining is recycled or, and they very little is sent to landfill. So Sweden is one of the countries that's been very proactive in taking care of their waste in a more um, energy friendly way. So what happens to the trash? Uh, this is 250 million tons of uh, garbage that is produced in the US. It is transported via trucks to a facility where it is buried in layers and compacted. That's called a landfill. And uh, average landfill actually produces a lot of methane as a byproduct. That is called a landfill gas. So this landfill gas, I can, I will go into that in more detail, cannot be released to the atmosphere and must be treated. So what does a landfill look like? Typically a landfill is constructed by putting a liner, typically a, a, that is impermeable to water like clay and uh, sometimes a plastic liner is also added. Then the garbage is put in layers and compacted with some uh, layers of earth in between and then the after it is uh, you know filled up to maybe like 40 50 feet in height it is covered with uh, a layer of earth and so then some uh, grass or other is growing on top sometimes a layer of uh, plastic is also put on the top in order to prevent rainwater from leaching into the trash the leachate the water that is uh, and, uh, produced or entering into the this um, trash uh, build up here is uh, called leachate and that is uh, usually contains a lot of organics as well as other undesirable materials. So they have to be collected and treated before being released to the water bodies. Um, as I said, the biodegradable component in the waste degrades with time and they produce gases and mostly methane and carbon dioxide. So that is released to the atmosphere uh, if it left un untreated. So the biogas uh, produced or landfill gas that is produced contains a lot of methane which is the same as natural gas, right? Mostly natural gas is mostly methane. Uh, some carbon dioxide, 53 percent is the average, but 38 percent carbon dioxide and then you have some nitrogen, oxygen that leaks into the gas. Um, this also contains uh, hydrogen sulfide and, and ammonia, a little bit of ammonia that makes it smell bad. And uh, more recently it's also been to contain larger percentage of comp uh, silicon compounds called siloxanes which are mostly coming from consumer products like shampoo that is disposed of. So it's a more uh, detailed breakdown of all the different compounds that are present in the landfill gas. So why is LFG a problem? Why is landfill gas a problem? Methane is a potent greenhouse gas in the sense that it is uh, most 20 times more potent than carbon dioxide in the sense that it can absorb 20 times more energy from the sun as it comes through the atmosphere. 
so its contribution to global warming is very severe therefore it is desirable to limit the amount of methane that is uh, emitted to the atmosphere so uh, some of the landfill gas also contain um, potentially harmful compounds so that will be a health hazard uh, uncollected methane can lead to fire as well as explosions in the landfill as it has happened and therefore because of all these reasons the environmental protection agency in the US has requires landfill gas operators landfill operators to monitor and treat the landfill gas emissions so if you look at uh, emission of methane in the the, the contribution of landfill gas to methane emissions right now is about 18 percent okay the, a larger percentage comes from enteric fermentation that is all the cows that are eating grass and other things they digest it and they actually produce methane during the process that's called enteric uh, fermentation and when you produce uh, natural gas or petroleum then also a lot of methane is released to the atmosphere so our goal right now is to try and at least tackle this 18 percent that is released so it, as an example of what will happen if you leave landfill gas untreated this uh, this is a very large uh, landfill in Mumbai and last year it caught fire and that burned for many days before they could put it out and during that process it was uh, creating a lot of uh, noxious fumes for creating health problems for the people living in the uh, neighborhood as it's a very highly populated thickly populated area as well so well, what to do with this landfill is the next question um, in terms of uh, amount of landfill I mentioned 230 million tons of landfill production on, per year. Landfill gas, at average uh, landfill will produce 2,800 cubic feet per minute of landfill gas. You know that that's a it's a lot of gas that's produced. And uh, so, because uh, it is a problem, the methane is a problem. What EPA recommends is to put in pipes to collect the landfill gas and then at least burn it so what you do when you burn it is you're converting the methane to co2 and therefore reducing the greenhouse gas uh, problem associated with the methane emission so there is a lot of landfills in the u.s as you can see it is kind of concentrated in regions where there is a lot of population and um, so northeastern region as well as in the midwest and uh, west coast region are the most populated regions in the u.s and uh, they're producing each and all these landfills each are producing these gases and they have been asked to put in uh, this gas collection systems so uh, over all these projects that are going on going in the in the landfills potential 100 billion cubic feet of landfill gas is produced which can uh, produce um, quite a large amount of landfill now uh, energy from uh, can be produced if you use it correctly so these are the piping systems that you have to these are perforated plastic pipes and uh, once you in, enter that into the landfill uh, they are connected to a main line and then there is a blower that kind of sucks up all the gas and brings it in and then once you I can you can flare it that is a simpler solution but you can also put it to use you know the simplest thing that you can do is to put it to an engine that will produce power electrical power the landfill gas is uh, produced over a period of time in the landfill typically it will can last anywhere from 30 to 40 years so in the beginning there isn't uh, that much that much production but over a period of time it will stabilize the carbon dioxide will build up and then the methane will build up and eventually you will uh, reach a stable region which is 30 50 percent approximately methane with small amounts of nitrogen and other gases and then that continues for another 10 to 15, 20 years 
So the current options I mentioned is to burn it, that's called flaring, or you can produce electricity from it, that is uh, there are a range of technologies, you can use uh, internal combustion engines or you can use uh, turbines to produce electricity and uh, then uh, the third option is that is being explored not quite commercial this is commercial now and in use this uh, this is to come to purify and remove the co2 and then you can compress it to produce compressed natural gas or cng and uh, this is uh, often used in vehicles uh, gas powered vehicles or you can liquefy it and uh, transport it as liquefied natural gas so that that requires purification compression or liquefaction so this is a, a, a CNG uh, it's a power generation facility where you have the landfill gas collection system that is then um, sent through a compressor compressed and then it is uh, some of the water is condensed and, pu and the water gas is purified and uh, after it is purified it is then sent to the engines where the engines produce power that is put on the grid. The other option I mentioned is uh, con compressing it. So here you need a series of um, separators to remove the carbon dioxide usually pressure swing absorption is used PSA to remove the carbon dioxide and membranes and then you after you removed it you can compress it and then uh, put it in a pipeline to transport it to uh, locations needing the compressed natural gas. So let me go over the advantages and disadvantages of each of these technologies for treating the landfill. Flaring is very cheap because the investment needed is very small and it's easy to do. The negative is that it's uh, waste, va wasting a valuable resource like methane. The second option that is available is to generate power. It is found widespread usage and uh, it decreases the uh, methane emissions. It, uh, the difficulty with using this technology is the value of the power produced is uh, quite small in the sense that when you put power back on the grid, let's say that you have a photovoltaic collection facility in your home and you produce power and you put it back on the grid. Normally the, when, the, when the utility buys back power from you as a producer, they are not going to give you the same rate that you pay them when you buy from them, right? It's buying and selling. So you only get about half the price. That is what it costs the utility to produce the power. So when you consider that into account, this becomes uh, not very profitable. In other words, you don't actually make money from producing the power because you have to invest in the power generation facility. Uh, CNG also has the problem that uh, you have a large equipment cost for producing the CNG, compressed natural gas and uh, it produce it completes with the cheaper natural gas that is available on the market okay so those are the issues that are faced by the landfill operators so that uh, allowed us as a chemical engineer i am involved in technologies for uh, mainly in the uh, my expertise is primarily the catalyst area you know i have been working on how you can use catalyst to do chemical reactions. So we thought maybe we could bring that technology to use for addressing this particular problem. That's what I've been working on for the last uh, 10 years or so. So what we saw was why not take the landfill gas, convert that into diesel fuel because diesel fuel is actually needed by the garbage trucks. So if you produce a diesel fuel, you can use it within house, within the house. Um, so it's a high value added product and I'll show you why it is a high value added product and it also now becomes a domestic fuel source. The issues of course are uh, what is the technology needed for this conversion process and how do you do it.
So first I want to make the case for why we want to use a liquid fuel. Liquid fuel by the way diesel is one of the most dense energy dense fuels. What do you mean by energy dense? For the same volume how much energy is contained. Okay, That way diesel becomes one of the most energy dense compared to that uh, gasoline is only about 90 percent if it as efficient and if you look at LNG it's only 60 percent if you look at CNG it's only 25 percent which means that if you want to run a vehicle on compressed natural gas you're going to need a tank that is four times as big to go the same distance right so uh, the, so those are some of the issues that are related to uh, and, uh, and because of the fact that diesel is such a high energy density fuel, uh, people are willing to pay a premium for that. Premium in the sense that the value of uh, liquid fuel normally is about three to four times that much of a gas fuel. So here I am comparing uh, oil price, crude oil prices versus natural gas price on a per BTU basis same bit the amount of energy. So I am just showing that gas price is about uh, one third to one fourth that of the uh, liquid fuel. So that is the motivation to try and make uh, liquid fuel. If you can make liquid fuel maybe you can make it more profitable. That is the idea. So how do you convert uh, uh, this uh, to liquid fuel? I want to go over that process. So here we are dealing with um, biomass that is produced by anaerobic digestion in the landfill gas, right? The landfill, the garbage that goes, uh, di you know, decay produces biogas. Another way to deal with it is to deal with biomass directly and you can gasify it to produce biogas. So those two options are available, but um, uh, right now we are focused on this route here, okay? So anything that is uh, wet waste is easily digested. Dry waste, like if you have tree limbs, for example, they don't digest that easily. So you may have to go through a gasification step to produce the biogas. So after you produce the biogas, which is methane and CO2, you have to reform it. So reforming is done in a reactor. That's where the catalyst comes in. So you need a catalyst to convert the biogas to syngas. Syngas is a mixture of carbon monoxide and hydrogen and we need that mixture to do the liquefaction step which is um, called the Fischer-Tropsch synthesis that converts uh, again a catalyst is used to convert that into a liquid. So a two step process both the steps are expensive to construct and operate that's, uh, that's why we need the research. So the reaction sequence in the reforming step there are uh, try try reforming try reforming in the sense there are three reactions that to go on uh, methane reacts with carbon dioxide methane can react with water or methane can re react with oxygen and they all produce the fuel syn gas syn uh, synthesis gas carbon monoxide hydrogen mixture and we need a one is to two ratio this is the ideal ratio that we need so these are uh, some of the catalysts that are used for that purpose. Sometimes if you don't get the right ratio, you can adjust it using something called water gas shift reaction. Again, another catalyst is used for that. And finally, the FTS, Fischer-Tropsch synthesis, takes the carbon monoxide and hydrogen and produces your uh, diesel fuel or liquid fuel. And I said CN. N can vary anywhere from 1 to 20, 30 or so. So it produces actually a synthetic crude oil, not pure diesel. So we have to purify that further. So just a brief history on this um, Fischer Trop synthesis. This was invented by two chemists called uh, Fischer and Traubs. They were working in Germany in the early 1900s. So during the First World War, Germany was faced with a shortage of oil. So they wanted to produce oil from coal. So they said, okay, we'll gasify coal and then produce the fuel. So they worked hard and came up with the, the catalysts that are used for this conversion process. So uh, it is done on a, on a very large scale. So in addition to producing fuel, it also can produce a lot of other chemicals 
in the pro in along the way. To give you an idea about the scale of this operation, here is a very large reactor that is used for the conversion and uh, here standing below are some people so you can see the size of the reactor is about you know four or five meters in diameter and four you know eight ten meters in length uh, and the reason to do this on a large scale is economy of scale so anything that you do on a very large scale becomes cheaper right so that they, they use uh, very large uh, processes and this is done in, only in uh, the only country that right now produces oil from coal is South Africa because they had that problem earlier that they were faced with apartheid uh, or having apartheid they were uh, there was an oil embargo placed on them they couldn't import any oil so they, they decided to use this coal to produce the oil. They still continue to do this and they do it on a very massive scale makes it profitable. Uh, to to uh, here is a pictorial depiction of what how that actually happens in a uh, the, here is the catalyst particle these these are some of the catalyst particles that are that are made in our lab and the catalyst particle is actually has a a coating of cobalt around a silica particle and that actually causes the reaction to go on the sur on so on the surface the carbon monoxide and uh, hydrogen come together, they form large molecules and that becomes the CnH2n, that's your part of, uh, that's what makes the oil. This is uh, a typical fractionation of the product that is synthetic crude oil that is produced by fissure tropes and this is again from our, uh, taken from our lab. Uh, I have not shown the amount, this is just a liquid fraction, okay, there is a gas component that is not shown here, so it will also produce methane, propane, butane, etc. Uh, but the useful part is the liquid part, which is C6, C7, the fuel, uh, uh, jet fuel and diesel fuel fractions are shown here in the middle, called the middle distillate. You also get some very heavy waxes as a byproduct, which is uh, has to be treated further before you can ut utilize those. So the process for converting um, uh, the ga uh, landfill gas to liquid would consist of a pretreatment facility. So we need to pretreatment facility here where the gas is purified removing the hydrogen sulfide ammonia etc and some water go through the tri reforming step and go through the fissure tropes eventually you go through a distillation separation and you end up with this product this is our con conceptualized process the pretreatment consists of hydrogen sulfide removal and uh, Usually you use a bed of iron or nickel and, uh, and also to remove some of the siloxanes you will use a carbon charcoal to remove that. So those are removed in the pretreatment system. After pretreatment it is compressed to a very large pressure usually 10, uh, 5 to 10 atmospheres before it is sent to the reformer which is inside a furnace. because. The reforming step is very high temperature. It uses up a lot of energy at uh, 800 to 900 degrees Celsius. It is cooled and then uh, compressed again before it is sent to the fissure tropes reactor, which is uh, uh, happening at around 300, 200 to 300 degrees Celsius. And then it is cooled and separated using uh, some distillation columns. You will produce some wastewater. A lot of wastewater is produced as a result of this reaction and by the distillation you will produce uh, gasoline and uh, heavier hydrocarbons, diesel and other hydrocarbons. So the, the amount of uh, distillate that is produced in the middle varies depending on the kind of catalyst that is used. So I told you that my expertise is in catalysis, so we, what we have been trying to do is to try and 
increase the yield of the diesel and jet fuel minimizing the gas fraction and the heavy fractions so that uh, we can um, get the right amount of uh, or larger amount of diesel as well as gasoline in the product. So let's look at the economics of this process. So we did a, a techno-economic study using 2500 standard cubic feet per minute for a typical large landfill. We designed the plant and uh, calculated the cost of our capital and operating <laughs> expenses and compared against competing technologies. So right now we, for the analysis we have assumed uh, a price of uh, $4 for the uh, fuel and uh, for the gasoline $1.50 per gallon. Um, so most of the fuel revenue comes from the diesel and smaller amount comes from the gasoline that is produced. So the results show a, assuming a plant life for about 15 years for uh, operating uh, and we end up with a capital investment of about 11 million dollars operating expense of five five million dollars US dollars and uh, the revenue estimated at 9.4 million from the diesel and the gasoline that is produced so using those numbers uh, use a positive rate of return 38 percent rate of return uh, over the 15 years. So that shows you the discounted cash flow rate of return. In about six years, you will recover your investment and then you are making uh, net present worth is increasing. When you look at the sensitivity of the uh, rate of return, rate of interest rate of return as a per percentage of the price of diesel, you can see it is heavily dependent on the price of diesel. So if you if the price of diesel you know decreases by 10 percent you can go from 25 percent rate of return to about uh, 16 percent rate of return unfortunately the price of diesel is never constant in the market you know it keeps fluctuating quite a bit so that is a, a problem if this is the price of diesel uh, plotted over the last 20 years you can see, you know, initially it was uh, uh, selling at about a dollar per gallon. During the 2000 years, there was a, a huge increase uh, due to the economic growth in India, driven by in, growth in India and China primarily. Price of crude oil went up. Along with that, the price of diesel went up to about $4.5 per gallon. Then it dropped, uh, you know, there was a, a big economic crisis in 2008, you may remember that. Uh, banks was crash, crashing that brought the price suddenly down to about a uh, little over two dollars per ga uh, gallon and then it recovered it was steady for about around four for a while and then more recently there is a glut of oil on the market the oil price went from eighty dollars now it's around fifty dollars a barrel so right now we are down to about 2.5 so this uh, price fluctuation is a problem for us right so when you look at our profitability of this process you find that if the diesel price went go from five dollars to three dollars you know you're going to be in the negative you're not going to make any money so that's the issue that we have to deal with so how do you improve that is uh, by improving the process you know you work on the process to lower the cost by improving the efficiency of the conversion reduce the energy cost and reduce the uh, increase the yield of the product so right now we are producing a lot of fuel gas. We have to figure out how to reduce that. Anyway, anyway, based on the current uh, analysis that I showed you, uh, the rate of return on producing electricity is around 13 percent. CNG is about 14 percent, and uh, we were showing 25 percent. But remember that all these are subject to a lot of fluctuations because of the uncertainty in the prices in the market. So it's only based on one-time analysis. Or you cannot take that as a final answer. So uh, I want to then conclude my uh, talk here with uh, these points. Um, with landfill gas, flaring is, is uh, uh, wasting a valuable resource. Electricity production remains the most popular option despite concern about emissions as well as 
low rate of return on investment. CNG is, uh, LFG to CNG is showing promise. Uh, because the price of gas is so low, many of the garbage trucks in the US have converted to using CNG instead of diesel. Uh, but the conversion costs about $30,000 per truck. It's a big investment as well. So, but it shows some promise and, uh, but the cost is still high. The LFG to liquid option is showing a high rate of return, but that is based on some assumed price of diesel. It is a, a high risk option because the technology is not also completely proven. So we are currently working on building a pilot plant to, we have done all the bench scale work on the lab. So now we want to build a pilot plan to see whether, uh, what are the real issues faced when you use uh, real landfill gases and, what are the, uh, and how to generate data that can be used for a better economic design of a large scale plant. So the return will increase if the diesel oil prices uh, rise and uh, it's inversely proportional to the price of natural gas as well. And so summarizing. Uh, the talk, uh, I only addressed landfill gas, but remember that all the technology that we are developing will apply to any kind of biogas. So if you have uh, agricultural waste like straw or if you have uh, forest residues uh, like tree limbs, you can convert that into biogas through a gasification step and then use the same technology to convert that into liquid fuels. It's technically feasible, but economic challenges exist right now because of the oil prices are fluctuating a lot. So challenges are in trying to come up with uh, increased yield, reducing the fuel gas production and the energy requirements for the conversion. Right now, we are recovering only about one third of the energy contained in the feed as fuel. So we need to increase that. So catalyst and reactor design uh, can improve these, address these issues. Uh, bios, biomass waste is a viable candidate because the landfill gas itself is an unwanted product. So you're, therefore you're not paying any extra money for the raw material and therefore there is a greater potential to make money. So the technology is still under development. So I would like to acknowledge all the other people who contributed some of the faculty at the University of South Florida, my colleague Dr. Kuhn, Dr. Venkat, Goswami and Woolen, um, all the students who worked on this for their master's PhD projects. And um, finally, of course, I want to thank all the people who funded this work, including uh, National Science Foundation, DOE, uh, NASA and and lastly the Fulbright Nehru Fellowship which is actually making possible for me to stand here and give the lecture. So here are some nice pictures about the University of South Florida located in Tampa. Uh, like Colombo is next to the beaches, a lot of nice beaches. So that uh, concludes my talk. This is a picture of the energy consumption in the world where all the what are the consumers of energy in the world. Uh, with that, I would like to open it up for some questions from the audience. Yes. For the, uh, for the landfill gas facility, okay. It's based on Typical landfills produce anywhere from 1,000 to 2,500 standard cubic feet per day of gas. So with that, you can produce about 7,000 gallons of diesel and uh, gasoline. So that's the scale of operation. So it's a very small scale. Yeah. And that was how much job in the field? To get that landfill of that size, how much it comes of garbage? How many tons of garbage? Okay, um, one ton of garbage will produce about uh, one gallon of fuel, I think, approximately. I'm, I'm sorry, one barrel of fuel. 
Yeah. One ton of garbage can produce approximately one barrel of fuel. Uh, no, this is per day. Uh, I mean, the, it is produces continuously, right? Or the yeah, gas. So I'm sorry uh, to correct myself. One ton is producing one. I said one barrel approximately, right? So, no, no, not per day. It just yeah. So if you're producing so much per day or so many tons per day, that continues over the 30 years. You can use it as a biogas. Um, well, uh, it, it, it is like the biogas that is produced in uh, Gober gas uh, facilities, right? Uh, they, yeah, you can use it if there is a user available for it. So if you are willing to put it into a pipeline and send it over to somebody who needs it, you can use it, but it's a low quality. It, it contains only about 50% methane, right? So the energy content is only half of that of natural, uh, say, the LPG gas that you would be using normally in your home. Um, so you will have to use um, larger burners to produce same amount of energy. So it means you have to you have to get separate. Uh, you cannot use the same burners that you use for your uh, normal uh, LPG. You will have to. Uh, Use that. Right, so right now that's what the most people, most landfill operators are trying to generate power. As I mentioned to you, they, they, there is a problem in the return on investment because you, you have to invest in the equipment that is used for the power generation. Uh, the, the saving uh, grace here, the fact that they can actually stay in operation is due to the subsidy that is provided uh, uh, because it is a renewable source, there is a carbon credit that comes to them and that allows them to get some uh, help from the, in the form of carbon tax. So they are getting some benefit from that. Because that will be considered, that, that power produced will be considered renewable power. And most of the power companies have been told to have a certain percentage of their power come from renewable sources and so that pressure is on. So with your research that you are doing in, in Mumbai, so you are getting this uh, biogas from the garbage dump there, right? Uh, not, I am not doing that in Mumbai, I am sorry, I am working with uh, some of the researchers sorry. there but most of my work is in South Florida, University of South Florida. And uh, what we are doing uh, there is uh, contacting the landfill operators nearby Tampa and we are entering into agreement with them to get the landfill gas from them. And they are more than willing to cooperate with us because they see this as a potentially uh, you know, game changing technology if it is successful. So, uh, it, it so uh, no, no, biogas has uh, almost 50% methane, 50% CO2. CO2. So, does this CO2 help you in diesel production or you have to sweep it off? It, it does help. Uh, if you look at the chemistry, um, you know, you have methane is CH4, whereas uh, if you look at diesel, it is CH2, right? One is to two. So, there is excess hydrogen available in the methane. So, the carbon dioxide can provide the additional carbon to combine with that excess hydrogen. So that, that's why we call it uh, uh, tri-reforming or bi-reforming. You know, the, the catalyst that we are developing is to have a combination of methane and CO2 react to produce the synthesis gas. But so it is... Words, what you are saying is the carbon in CO2 gets converted into a fuel. Yes, but it's expensive, I mean, energy intensive because it is a, a very endothermic process. So you have to add energy to make that happen. So that's why I said that only about one third of the energy contained in the fuel 
is recovered as energy in the product. The rest is used up in the process itself because of the energy inefficiencies. So, in other words, you can get carbon credits for CO2 in the biogas? Yes. Because you are converting that into diesel? Yes. And uh, CH4, one molecule is equal to 20 molecules CO2, 22. Equivalent, yes. So, in other words, if you convert uh, one mole of methane, you get 22 carbon credit. Yes. Then one mole of CO2, you get one mole. So, you get 23 credits. carbon credits. Yes. So, that itself is that, something that, that, the, Yeah, that, that makes it uh, worthwhile to pursue that. So, what is the rate now of CO2? 15 dollars per ton? Uh, I am sorry, I don't know the number, but the, there is the carbon credit. Uh, yeah, the, no, yeah, carbon credit is less than a dollar. Less than a dollar? That Kyoto Protocol at that time, it was 12 dollars. Yeah, now okay. we got yeah, in this Paris. Is, is there any change with the Paris Accords or no? No, no change in the carbon credits given. It's one dollar per ton. Okay, so that should actually help uh, about one dollar per gallon for diesel fuel, I think. So, what do you think of the future of this uh, conversion of natural gas into liquids? Oh, okay, that's a million dollar question for me. Uh, I, I'm, of course, I am involved in the technology heavily in con trying to commercialize it, right? Therefore, it is my hope that we can actually do this successfully. And uh, the proof is in the pudding, as they say. So, uh, only when we actually build a plant and produce a fuel, if, uh, then only we can tell you that it is successful. Until then, it is a question mark. And luckily for us, uh, you know, the government is willing to provide uh, uh, these uh, startup funding for these kind of ventures. So, their government is actually funding us to try to commercialize the technology. So, uh, they see it as a good bet. <laughs> How does this compare with algae? To which one? Algae. Algae, algae okay. Uh, okay. Um, there the, are the a lot of people working even at our university on trying to convert algae and uh, make a biodiesel, bio, biodiesel from algae. Um, I cannot really, I'm not an expert on it, but I think there are issues related to what the profitability would be. In other words, can you grow algae fast enough to create a, an algae plant? Uh, uh, algae has an advantage that it needs CO2 to grow. So, when you grow algae, you can put it next to a power plant that produces CO2, pipe some of the CO2 to feed to the algae and therefore reduce the emissions. Um, so, people are working on trying to make that profitable as well. Like I said, it's not profitable, it's not commercial, nothing is commercial yet. I don't, I don't know any plant that has been constructed that produces biodiesel and uses it. So, it uh, will probably take again 15, 10, 15 years, I guess, to get to a commercial stage. Uh, no, I haven't, we haven't uh, included that. We, we are assuming that the landfill is there and the gas is there and they want to do something with the gas. So, therefore, we are telling them, okay. We will, we can, you know, if, if you invest 10 million dollars, you can convert that gas into liquid and you can use the liquid in your trucks. So, that's the argument we are giving to the landfill. But you can use the gas also directly Well, you have to purify the gas. That's the problem. You have to purify it and you have to compress it. Well, before purification, you have a separation also. Three steps. Separation of the CO2, purification to get rid of the bad stuff like H2S and ammonia. Third step is compression. So, all those three steps are required. Still, that will be cheaper than getting the diesel? Well, no, the question, you know, it, it, is not, it is not used anywhere as far as I, I know. It is still an experimental project. The power production is, is used, okay, but the, the compressed natural gas production is not yet uh, used. Uh, in, uh, widely, maybe one or two facilities are trying it out to see whether they can actually make it work. 
the problem is the gas is to compete on the market with uh, the gas price, right? I, as I mentioned to you, the price of gas is uh, quite low. It's only two dollars per million BTUs, uh, and whereas uh, diesel is worth about uh, eight to nine dollars per million BTUs. So when you you know, so when, in terms of the product value, it is uh, value added is much less. So it bec that's why we think that there is potential here if this can be made to work uh, successfully. Uh, the, the scale of operation I have to mention, right? That, that's very important. Uh, most of the fissure tropes plants built in the world and operating today are very large scale and they are, they are commercial because they are the scale. So when you're trying to do it on a smaller scale, your investment is much higher per per product. So therefore, uh, that could be a potential economic problem in the future for, for this particular process. Yes? You have to say how the campaigns novastic Yes. Right. Yes. Yes, um, uh, I'd like to comment on that. There is a, uh, quite a quite, there was quite an effort to uh, convert the garbage, wet waste, within households into gas and use it. Um, like I mentioned to you, the problem with the wet waste is that it is rather difficult to digest, and oftentimes, unless you maintain it well, the bacteria or the enzymes that are used for the conversion will die and uh, many many in fact I think in in India they try to sell this technology uh, small scale uh, units to to farmers to for their use and after six months uh, they gave up in trying to get this uh, technology to keep operating well so that that is one issue and uh, uh, if you mix um, some cow dung with the waste, it actually can help in doing that. Uh, the second problem that is often um, faced by the farmers is that this gas is of low calorie value and uh, women don't like cooking with uh, the low calorie fuels because it takes them twice as long <laughs> sometimes to do, do the, you know, to boil the rice or whatever, right? So uh, that's another issue, but I think that can be overcome by a better design of the burners and providing them with uh, designs that are particularly used for the biogas. So, uh, so if those two things can be done, uh, uh, trying to maintain the gas production uh, without interruption and uh, if you can use, use, use uh, convert the burners, uh, the use will be much higher and that will be, in terms of garbage collection and disposal, Landfilling should be the last option to consider. Okay, landfilling is probably the worst option. The best option is to uh, collect the, uh, at the very least, you can collect the wet waste and compost it. Just put it on a, you know, area where, cover it with a little bit of earth and let, let it compost. And then it will become CO2. The emission there is CO2, not methane. When you are composting, you are doing aerobic digestion the air oxidizes and produces uh, only carbon dioxide. Uh, so it's not as harmful. And, uh, and the, what is remaining is the good fertilizer, right? We, this organic 
and there is no need to buy um, chemicals to add to your uh, plants and so on. So that's a that's a good option to use. Getting people to change their habits of uh, you know mixing all the waste together into one pile and disposing it off that is another educational barrier we have to cross. Uh, providing separate containers for wet waste, dry waste, or recyclable items you know that those kind of th uh, things will help. But it takes uh, is more of a socio-economic political problem than a te technical problem. <laughs> I'm a, I am an engineer, so I only deal with technology problems, right? I cannot deal with all the other problems. Yes. So I think that's my question on that. Now, there are some of them are short, I think, for 15 years old. Do you think there's still potential to get gas for a Yes, uh, landfills can produce gas so for as long as 30, 35 years. So they are producing gas, and we may not be aware of it, but uh, in, yeah, yeah. Occasionally, occasionally catch fire, and that's when you know. And in, in the U.S., uh, the regulations are very strict. So all the landfill operators are required to put in monitors on methane at the top of the landfills. And uh, when that level exceeds a certain value, they have to put in the collection system because putting a collection system is also expensive and nobody wants to do it unless they have to do it. So by law they have to do it and then they invest the money to do it. In India do you have uh, municipal uh, uh, you know, biogas in uh, there are some cities, some cities, uh, municipalities that are providing households with the uh, biogas uh, uh, generation system and uh, uh, it is not widespread. I think I would say that it, it's only in a very small fraction of the municipalities that this is being done, implemented. Even um, most cities, they don't, like in Mumbai, I know for a fact that they don't segregate the waste. Everything is put into one big truck, hauled to the landfill, and it's not even. Uh, oftentimes, the landfill is not managed. You know, it, it, to, to manage a landfill requires pre-planning. You know, you have to layer the earth. You have to do all those things, and unless you do it with a lot of investment, it's it's not done correctly. So, so India was a leader sometime back for. Yeah, the, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, that's uh, that's why I was mentioning. You know, like 15, 20, 15 years ago, the government put a lot of money into providing the uh, farmers and other people with uh, biogas generation facilities. And uh, again, right now, if you go and in, uh, maybe less than five percent would be operational, for the reasons I mentioned to you. So it's not just enough to give the technology and the investment to them, but you also have to educate them, I think. And it, it may not be that easy to keep these things operational. Uh, unfortunately, that is not my area of expertise. And I don't actually work in the anaerobic digestion area. Uh, my work is mostly focused on the conversion step. So I cannot really comment uh, too much on that, why it's not successful. Uh, even though it was tried. Uh, I think right now most municipalities are opting to do the uh, composting, just providing areas where they can go and put the garbage and uh, it will degrade to become CO2. This, uh, I would say that you know, the government has been very yeah. A very small percentage. Actually, the cost of the catalyst, the catalysts used are uh, metals like iron, nickel, uh, and some small amounts of cobalt. Cobalt is the most expensive com component there. Uh, the, co the amount needed is quite small because they are used as nanoparticles. So they, they are very small amount of methane, I mean, uh, small amount of these metal particles are needed. Um, 
the problem is uh, in finding the right combination of metals and the right configuration of the catalyst particle in order to and the right temperature pressure conditions in order to get the maximum yield of the desired product because fissure troughs will produce a lot of gases and a lot of axes which are und undesirable and we want to try and get the catalyst which will give you the maximum amount of uh, middle distillate product. So that's where the challenges lie. Backbenchers. Oh, okay. You have experience in biotech. No, sir. No, sir. You have a question. You want to discuss? Yes, sir. There's another name of your same name, Joseph, down here. Let me show you the video. I guess I should stay here because it's being telecast or recorded. question okay first of all if you want to do this on a you know the the scale that we are talking about landfills landfills uh, are associated with uh, cities and towns so there is a actually a collection large amount of biomass waste comes into a landfill right so as a result you are producing fairly large amount of gas then it becomes uh, reasonable to try and build a plant to convert the biogas. If you are doing it on a very, very small scale like a household producing or a few households together or an apartment community producing the biogas, then you have to use it locally as is. There is no way to build the micro plants to do the conversion locally, right? So best thing would be to try and come up with uh, enough um, uh, Technologies that are easy to deploy and easy to maintain. The challenge is to maintain this digesters operating continuously without shutting down. You know, you have to maintain the bacterial count properly. How do you do that, you know, in an easy way? That is the challenge. So if you can educate the public on how to and make it simple design so that it is easy to operate then I think we have a good chance of at least meeting their cooking needs, right? So they can, they don't have to go out and buy the LPG cylinders from outside. They can produce enough to uh, do the cooking on their in-house. In so so as, I, as I mentioned, three things have to happen, right? One is educating the public to separate the waste, number one. Number two is to, uh, to design and deploy these biogas digesters that are easy to maintain and operate. And third thing is you want to maybe redesign the, the stove that is used in order to utilize the low calorie fuel because it's only half the calorie value. So those three things have to happen to make it a successful, a widely acceptable solution. Yes. Uh, which is in the 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 the
Yes. I think we are, we are digest, digressing a lot away from the technical component on this part. Yeah, yeah, I agree. I agree with you completely. Yes. Now, uh, one of my questions is a bit away from this. Now, you are developing catalysts, right? Yes. So, Fisher Trump's catalysts were developed in the early 19th uh, yes. century. Yes. And those were invention. Yes. Now, with your research, have you been able to increase the yield? Yes. We have been able to increase the yield of the middle distillate through the design of the, our catalyst, yes. So that means you don't have to wait for methane from your garbage dump, right? No. Because there are plenty of natural gas available in the world, right? right? And people don't know what to do with it because you can't store it, yes. right? Because mm -hmm. the storage cost is very high. LNG is minus 162 degree yeah. cryogenic liquid. Yeah. Compressed natural gas is 150 psig, right. uh, which is again high pressure, right? right? But if you can convert the natural gas, methane, using your new catalyst into liquids, yes, then the price difference two dollars to yeah. eight dollars yeah. will be favorable to, yeah. to yeah. make liquid. Right. In you fact, uh, yeah, In fact, a company in South Africa called Sasol. Yeah. They came to the U.S. to explore the very same thing. They were asking the question, "Can we build a plant here?" Because the USA has a lot of gas. They are exporting gas right now. And uh, they were asking the question whether they could efficiently convert the natural gas into diesel and sell it. But they eventually made a decision not to pursue the project because of the uncertainty in the uh, prices. Prices will go up. Prices can go up or down. Natural gas price will go up or down. So they eventually made a decision not to invest. But they did consider that very seriously for a while. And did the evaluation. So their catalyst is better than your one. Uh, uh, I think I think I think ours is better. So we we will hopefully so in the future we yeah we can uh, look forward to right Fisher crops with your catalyst. <laughs> yeah. LPG. LPG consumption mm -hmm. is in urban areas. Now, looking at the emission rates of biogas 
from biomass and the electric wells by imaging less than half. Uh, I don't see any potential in commercially you can use as an uh, alternative yeah. uh, because the, the mining production. That's what my question uh, is. So, uh, yeah, like, like I mentioned, commercially not, but within, like in in-house, uh, like, like the farmers in a, in, a, in a remote area, they may not have uh, access to any other energy source besides firewood. These kind of technologies can be extremely valuable. So, you know, trying to think of it as a commercial venture, no, I agree. I don't think that is, because you are competing with the gas prices in the market. And the LPG prices are low enough, right? And uh, they, they are not going to bother uh, with doing, you know, rather they will go out and buy the gas than produce it at a, an expensive rate. So. It will be a completely social project. Yes. And uh, where the feasibility is very poor and the payback period might be 20 30 years. We, yes. Yes, sir. Not, not short term, it's, it's, it's clear it's not a solution. Yeah, it's not a solution, but it's a solution to solution. No. Yeah. yeah, but USA is pursuing this on a larger scale, you know, they are saying that there is a lot of biomass, not waste, okay, just general biomass is forest residues and other things are available, maybe like a billion ton per year that's available that they are saying, okay, why don't we try and convert that into oil on a very large scale and uh, therefore depend, uh, reduce the dependence on imported oil. And uh, that can happen, but right now, like the, if the price of oil stayed at uh, $100 a barrel, that would happen, but it does. it is now $50 a barrel. So, the many, you know, the commercially it is not viable at this time, but in the future, if the prices uh, keep, you know, going up and uh, the demand of, uh, goes up, it might uh, become uh, attractive again. Yeah. No, I'm just talking about converting biomass, not biogas, <coughs> just the biomass to fuel, uh, liquid fuels. Yeah. The, yeah, the organ. Yeah, usually the that's true. Mm -hmm. yes. The waste in the developing countries contains more organic fraction than the uh, developed countries. Yes. I hope you receive some more jobs. <laughs> uh, not, not, not yet. You should try to draw Kalambo there. He went Kalambo, he said. City, city. Kalambo city. You go to call, yeah, how the detail comes on, the, how the main road you can see. Uh, all that, uh, and you can see burning thing, Madhula, no? Mm -hmm. uh, and you got caught fire. Caught fire, yeah. yeah. So it's there. <laughs> I hope not. <laughs> Bombay and this too. I mean, the entire city went out of function, right? Uh, no, the, the, the you know the area around that landfill. Yeah. Okay, then uh, uh, we have uh, Donald and I think that's almost one hour and fifty minutes, so I think he's a bit tired. Of that. <laughs> And I think there are some fantastic questions for which he gave appropriate answers and of course land, fields, garbage and all these, these are never any questions, right? So it is very good that you are doing research on development of at least to convert this land figures into figures, which some you know day in the future will become viable and we will have solutions to all these garbage dumps. So uh, once again I would like to thank uh, uh, Professor Babu. Joseph for his visit to Sri Lanka and also taking the time and the committing to conduct two lectures, one was conducted as well, which was good. And to this lecture, which I think it was really interesting to the audience. And you know, uh, 
rekindle sampai 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 dah you know ideas reach uh, you know those are these people have a lot of experience in this field so i think with your lecture they can think further and better so that collectively everybody can put their minds together and develop solutions to all this right. rubbish problem in the world so uh, uh, thank you uh, for the babu yeah. and uh, madam uh, joseph and also the entire audience for your presence here today and the great success and on behalf of the department of chemical research in the next section committee i would like to invite our secretary heshan uh, to deliver a simple word of thanks